What's up, listeners and supporters of the Ain't Hard to Tell podcast? We need some help from you, and it won't take up too much of your time. As we grow, we always want to hear your feedback, so take a minute or two to fill out a short, anonymous survey. The survey link is right in the episode notes for this podcast. It's easy and takes less than five minutes. As always, we thank you for your continued support. Tell Podcast, episode 182. Dexter Henry, Brian Fonseca here. Yeah. You there, wherever you are, hopefully doing well, staying safe and healthy. Uh, Brian, what's, what's going on with you this week, man? Uh, how you feeling? Had a barbecue last night, uh, the day before the Puerto Rican Day Parade, which is today, virtually. Um, next year, I'm going. I've already, <laughs> I've already made that promise to myself. Next year, unless it's like thunderstorms outside, I plan on going. But uh, yeah, I had way too much red meat, and I uh, feel it in my chest a little bit the day after. But sounds, uh, like, sounds like the food tasted good then. Oh is, my god, I mean, it was steak fresh off the grill, steak, chicken, moro, um, some really good salad too. A lot of people were drinking. I was not, but you know, uh, it was a, it was a great time, and and a lot, a lot of salsa in the background a lot wow. of music just continuously you know my uncle my uncle got the playlist going he uh he's an og you know what i'm saying so we had a we had a good time <laughs> that sounds good it, it, you made you made me think of uh something my man told me the the other day we were talking about going to events whether it be like a barbecue or you know thanksgiving or something like that you know especially if it's at somebody else's place right he was, yeah. he was making this point that usually if you go and the persons, the people, or the barbecue, whatever, the food is good. There's something that stands out. There's a dish that you remember. Something that you're like, oh, you know, next time I come back, I would would have this. You know, you got to have this. And I'm not going to say who it was, but he told me uh, about a particular place he had to go to for a holiday uh, that he was, you know, was kind of obligated to go to. And um, the food wasn't memorable. He told me there was nothing there he had that he'd ever go back and say. Yeah, I'd want that again. I take that was not the case for you with this barbecue. Oh, no, it was very. I mean, I felt it the next day, but it was very memorable. Look, whenever you go and this is a life hack, not a life hack, but a philosophy, rather, whenever you go to a barbecue or a function or things like that and you want to bring back a plate with you, that's how you know the food was good. So and we brought back two. We brought back two. That's that's also a good point. If you do not want to bring a plate back. Yeah, yeah, if they ask you, you want to take any home, and you're like, nah, I'm good, not a great sign. Yeah. Not a great sign. <laughs> yeah, no, 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 not a great sign. It's like, yeah, we, we, we should we should uh never come back here again. All right, cool. I haven't been to uh barbecue in a while, but we'll have one coming up in a couple of weeks, July mm. 4th, I'll be at that I know the food, I know the food is gonna be good. Like mm. there will be several plates coming home. Let's just say that. <laughs> several, several plates going home. Uh, we're going to get through this stuff as quickly as we can. A lot of stuff going on in the, the world of sports. NBA playoffs uh, heating up in the second round, although one team has now moved on to the Western Conference Finals. But when you're looking at the NBA playoffs, man, Brian and I were talking about this the other day. There has been a lot to be talked about in terms of teams being burnt out from last year in the bubble. And Brian was bringing up to his attention. He's like, look, see? The teams who were in the Final Four last year that made the Eastern and Western Conference Finals, now they're all out of the playoffs, right? Three of those teams were gone in the first round. The Denver Nuggets just got bounced in the second round by the Suns. Fatigue is a factor. And Brian, I know you saw this too, right? You looked at the Nuggets play, the Nuggets look gassed. Specifically Jokic, the MVP, the people's MVP. Jokic looked gassed. And then we saw in that uh, game four, he has a flagrant foul. And he was one, two, three, Cancun early, get me out of here. And uh, he looked like he just, no mas. Roberto Duran, no mas, didn't want any more, was done. <laughs> let's, uh, let's get out of here. And I think the fatigue was a factor that I, I think you have been harping on this all season long. But I think NBA pundits and people that covered it did not, how should I say this? I don't think they gave it enough validity in terms of how it would affect not just only the regular season, 
but just the, the postseason as well, too. And I think we've clearly seen the effects of it. Yeah, I think the thing is that, like, it's very easy to just look at the basketball games and just be like, mm, it's basketball, like, this is what it is. And, like, no, it's there's a lot of external factors that aren't sexy to talk about. And people have a lot of hot takes. And I don't think this is a hot take sort of thing. I think when you look at it, and it's kind of simple. It's like you look at the teams that went far last year, the Final Four from the bubble, uh, the Lakers, the, the Heat, the Celtics, and the Nuggets, all of them are eliminated now. None of them won a game past round one. The Heat didn't even win a game in round one. They got worn right. down by the Milwaukee Bucks, and they they all look tired at the end. They all look broken down and tired. The Nuggets lost Jamal Murray, torn ACL. Will Barton was out of the lineup. Monte Morris, uh, not Monte Morris because I did that last week. P.J. Dozer, uh, who they're relying on, was out of the lineup for a while. And you have uh, Compazzo and Austin Rivers as your starting backcourt in playoff games. and. You know, Jokic played every game and hadn't missed a game since the end of the 2018-19 season. And that was just because of rest. And he got suspended for a game earlier that year in January. He hasn't missed a game due to injury since the 2017-2018 season. He missed like a couple weeks with an ankle. It was early in 20. Uh, it was early during that season, I believe. So this is a, a guy who's been very durable, who just won MVP and things of that nature. And then, you know, Jamal Murray torn ACL. The Lakers, uh, LeBron could have stayed healthy. Anthony Davis could have stayed healthy. And they've just, you know, that they've had a lot of issues and had some COVID issues late in the year. But then a Schroeder uh, lineup changes, bringing in Andre Drummond, what's going to happen with Marcus Gasol, all that uncertainty. But it starts with Anthony Davis being hurt and LeBron James being hurt. The Celtics, they broke down. Kemba Walker in and out of lineup all year. Uh, Jason Tatum had COVID. And mm -hmm. is using an inhaler, and it took him a while to get back to being Jason Tatum, which we did see toward the end. But even still, like Jalen Brown was out with a broken wrist toward the end of the season, and they didn't have a lot of size as it was. Then the Miami Heat, which I've talked about extensively, like if you look at you know their lineups throughout the year, they had a bunch of guys with injury issues: Goran Dragic, Jimmy Butler, et cetera, et cetera. Jimmy Butler was an example that I was thinking about recently because I'm like, think about Jimmy Butler's last 11 months, right? Uh, June 2020, they show up to the facility, you know, down uh, in Miami because that was when teams were able to work out just before the bubble. Then in July, they show up to the bubble. In October, Butler, like, goes crazy in the NBA Finals, the triple doubles, the 40-point game. Somehow the, gets the Heat to win two games despite injuries to Bam and Drajic and things of that nature. And then seven weeks later, they're in training camp. And they have to get ready for the season. Same with the Lakers. They had seven weeks to prepare before this season. The Celtics and Nuggets had an extra two, nine weeks. Still very small because in this typical NBA season, and I use the 2019 example, the Toronto Raptors, uh, mid-June, I think June 13th, 2019 was their last game. Mm -hmm. They didn't have to report to training camp until three and a half months later. And that was the NBA champions, them and the Golden State Warriors, which means most other teams – didn't have three and a half months. They had like four, four, five months, four and a half, whatever. The teams that didn't make the playoffs had five months or whatever. And then going back to Jimmy Butler, it's like the season starts or training camp starts December 1st. Then on Christmas Day, he injures his ankle the second game of the season. A couple weeks later, he gets COVID, loses 12 pounds, comes back after two weeks and has his best regular season. And it's like, yeah, no shit. He's going to be worn down <laughs> after everything that they experienced. So like all four of these teams, I think fatigue is a big part of this. And it's not like, oh, they're bubble frauds and this, this and that. It's like, nah, that was the that was probably the most difficult NBA title to try to win. And I think we shouldn't diminish what the Lakers, Heat, Celtics and Nuggets did in the bubble because there were 18 other teams along with those four trying to do the same thing. And they just didn't get as far. Yeah, I think we should look at what they did as the bubble. It's highly impressive, not to mention you asking them to come back. Brian hit on the fact that they only had uh, the champions, the teams that played in the finals, seven weeks of, of rest, which is, you know, crazy and come back. And then they had to come back and play a condensed 72 game season, shortened, but very condensed. Most teams are playing on average three games a week. And last week, Baxter Holmes uh, for ESPN and ABC had put out an article about some of the data about NBA injuries, and we spoke about this uh, with Gerard Hector on the NBA Exchange, and there's some stats I want to read. The average number of players sidelined per game due to injury and non-COVID-19 illness uh, or rest of season was 5.1, right? 
right? Like that, like that's that's a lot. This was according to ESPN's Kevin Pel- Pelton. This was the highest since uh, he started tracking in 2009, 2010. That does not include games missed by players in the health and safety protocols. The next highest was 4.8, and that was the 2020-21 season. So, excuse me. So the 2020 to 2021 season was five percent higher than what that next season was, and the increase was even more pronounced. When focusing on the league stars, the seasons, the the season uh, all stars missed 270 of a possible 1,944 games. That's 19. percent So players fatigued, as you said, Brian. Players uh, injured consistently. The numbers prove that. And then we're seeing that the results in the playoffs, where these teams were not able to advance far. And like I said, I think the Nuggets are a great example, even though they had Jokic. They won a first-round series. You talk about the injury to Jamal Murray. Jokic looked gassed. I mean, he looked really tired. He did not have the same bounce that we even saw from him in the first round. I just think he had nothing left to give. He's been going at it hard, and I'm sure he's happy to get back home to Serbia and get some rest. Uh, But, like, yeah, I, I just think overall we can take the bubble as this one thing we can look at and the teams. But I, I still think overall we need to look at getting players more rest um, I think the season should be shortened, although I understand that's never going to happen, most likely because these owners care about money and keeping these 41 home games that they have a year. You know, Gerard Hector, our friend, has, he has proposed a 56-game season, which I'm hugely in favor of. Uh, but, you know, unfortunately, I think there's, the games are going to stay the same and they're probably going to do expansion and we're going to have two more teams. But this is what happens when you try to, push these things and get the money. I mean, maybe it's good. We got some new people that we didn't see in the playoffs go far last year and maybe a new cha- – well, definitely a new champion, but maybe a team that's never even won a title before. So, you know, we'll see. But there's no doubt these teams are burnt out. There's no doubt about that at all. And let me point this out <clears throat> because I think that while it will be beneficial to some degree for all these four teams and, you know, the others to have their long rest, <clears throat> even whoever makes the finals this year – they're gonna have a, like a two month turnaround. We saw the schedule mm-hmm. come out. Good we point. saw the schedule come out this year, and uh, oh, by the way, it's not including the Olympics, which <laughs> are right after the NBA season. Mm-hmm. Um, training camp is gonna be in late September, so we're going back to normal for the 2021 2022 season. Training camp is late September. That means preseason is gonna be October. The season is gonna begin in like mid October because preseason is supposed to be shortened now. The season is gonna run through April, so you're talking about a six month regular season. Like the whole thing's back to normal. Whoever goes into the NBA Finals, they're gonna be playing through at least mid July, late if it's a long series, and they're gonna have two weeks, uh, two months rather, so roughly eight weeks to prepare uh, for next season, which is a little more than what the Heat and Lakers had before this year and a little less than what the Celtics and Nuggets had before this year. So you're going to see something similar maybe because, again, this and this isn't going to be a 72-game season either. It's going to be a regular 82-game season. So I think it's mm-hmm. entirely possible that this, uh, this coming season, after an Olympic year, depending on who plays, uh, could be much worse potentially uh, as guys are just starting to break down. So, you know, I think uh, we're going to see guys take a – more uh, rest days and you know we're not going to see you know mostly anybody at least from the star players you know play 82 games I'd be surprised if because Jokic did 72 this year he's probably the only one of the major stars of note that did that I don't know how many guys are going to be playing 82 games like I don't think we're going to have an Andre Miller who's doing that for five six years in a row um you know maybe ever again yeah I don't know if you'll ever see that again and transitioning to that you know, maybe one of the teams is benefiting from possibly a little bit of rest right now. Could be those Phoenix Suns. They swept the Denver Nuggets uh, to move on to the Western Conference Finals. It looks like they'll probably get at least a week of rest, depending on how the uh, Clippers Jazz series goes. So that should be uh, very interesting, and that can help them. Are you? I know our producer Greg. He's been on that Suns train. Are you surprised what the Suns did? Uh, against the Nuggets, or should we sort of expected it because of the fatigue here? Yeah, I, I kind of, I'm kind of on the second side of that now. Like while I did expect it to be a slightly longer series, I didn't think the Nuggets were going to win. Even though I kind of like, I thought about it for a second or whatever because like they have Nikola Jokic at the end of the day, but I, I, I think that Phoenix had too much. But also, I was anticipating 
the tiredness. And it kind of also makes me look at Portland, right? The Lakers lost to the Suns in round one, understandable, two versus seven. The Suns were a very complete team and have been, and the Lakers had their injury issues with Anthony Davis. And, you know, their depth, not as great as I thought it would be coming into the year. Dennis Schroeder was kind of uh, disappointing this year. Montrez Harrell, not as impactful as I thought he was going to be. Uh, Taylor Horton Tucker kind of comes and goes. Kyle Kuzma, you're not really sure. Like, there's a lot of uncertainty there. Andre Drummond wasn't that impactful either. Marcus Soles, older. Like, you just go up and down the roster. Like, I get that. Uh, the Heat, while I didn't think they were going to lose in uh, four games, I wasn't surprised, you know, looking back on it because, again, they looked very, Jimmy Butler especially, looked very gassed. And Bam Adebayo, actually, for, you know, at some, at some points. Um, and then... With the Celtics, you just knew that they were going to get overwhelmed by the Nets. But with the Nuggets, they had Portland. And of all the teams I just mentioned, Portland is probably the weakest one, save for Boston, of that entire group. Looking Not back on it, you know, because they can't guard anybody. And Jokic, uh, probably, you know, the best player in that series. He's the MVP. It, it, it helps to have your best player be closer to seven feet tall than closer to six feet tall, which they have versus uh, Damian Lillard. And, you know, they were able to just sort of bully Portland at some points. Like, they had a couple of losses there, one particularly bad one, but they were able to overcome it. And I just thought that Denver could have easily lost in the first round had they gotten a different kind of matchup. Like, mm. I don't know if they would have beaten the Clippers. I don't know if they would have beaten Dallas. Like, I don't, I don't know if they would have beaten the Lakers, for that matter, or Phoenix, mm. or any of these other teams. But they got Portland, and that was a soft matchup for them. And, you know, I wasn't too surprised – you know, seeing this series play out because again, they look gas. And that's kind of been my point all season long about some of these teams who went really far last year that they were going to pay for it on the back end for better or for worse. Yeah, I think they did. I think it's a great point about the fact that had they played a different team, it could have been a lot different, but we got to give credit to the Suns too, because the Suns are just looking like a complete team out here. Mm -hmm. um, everything is clicking right. Chris Paul, even after injuring his shoulder in that first round series against the Lakers, He's looking good right now. Devin Booker has been one of the most impressive young players in this postseason. Their role players, uh, Mikel Bridges, looking good. Cam Johnson, representing the University of Pittsburgh, looking mm. good uh, as as well, too. And then, you know, I think the biggest X factor that everybody said for this team this season, and I didn't know how this dude would perform in the playoffs, was DeAndre Ayton. And he's been fantastic. He's really given it to the bigs, uh, whether it be a exhausted Nikola Jokic or injured Anthony Davis, I don't care. He came out there and performed. And that should absolutely be noticed with what he's been doing. So the Suns, I give them a lot of credit. I think whoever they face in the Western Conference Finals, I don't know how the betting odds are going to be on that, but I think you got to start respecting them in that way. Uh, you know, we talked on NBA Picks and Props, Brian and I did, along with our friends uh, Jamal Murphy and Gerard Hector, about getting in on the Suns now if you wanted to place a bet on them to win the championship. But I think people are going to start respecting them a little bit more now in how they've been playing and what they've been doing because you can see this is a complete team that looks really like a well-oiled machine. They're playing well together. They look confident together. They don't look like they're afraid of anybody. Um, and who knows? A lot of crazy things that happen in this playoffs. Injuries. We'll get to that in a second. On the net side, a lot of things are cr crazy. Things are happening, and now you got to start thinking: Why can't the Suns win? You know, why can't they uh, win it all? I know, like I said, our producer Greg, he's had them going to the finals, but why can't they win it all? It really just depends on some of the matchups. Brian, you've been saying all year, who's the healthiest team standing? At the end, it might just come down to that. And I think we're seeing a lot of that, too. The Suns have had a good fortune of health with Chris Paul looking right now, 37 in that game four. So, you know, we'll see. But the Suns right now, they look like they're rolling. Backpack Broadcasting continues to bring you the best original sports content. But now you can get more of the content you love. For as little as $3 a month, you can get access to bonus content, including behind the scenes footage and interviews from the Sports Walk, Sideline Stories, or the Ain't Hard to Tell podcast. All this exclusive content comes via Patreon. There are tiered levels of patronage, and each Backpack Broadcasting patron receives exclusive perks. Your support helps Backpack Broadcasting create more of the original content that you love. Visit Backpack Broadcasting's Patreon page and become patron today
There was something good that I read uh, this week. It was an article, Brian, from Jamel Hill. I thought it was really fantastic, and it really hit something I've been thinking about in the world of sports, and it surrounds Simone Biles. Uh, and the exact title of the article, I want to bring it up for, to provide Jamel Hill with The Atlantic, was Gymnastics Doesn't Know What to Do with Simone Biles' Dominance. And I read this, and I had been thinking something similarly along the lines of Jamel Hill and this, and I think she's absolutely right. Uh, if you have not been paying attention, and I can see why you're not, because I don't think the media has done a good enough job of highlighting Simone Biles. And I know what some people are going to say. Well, this is not one of the four major sports. No shit, Sherlock. Like, I don't know that. Thank you. But what this woman has done in terms of her dominance athletically has been absolutely amazing. And it, some people, and I don't know Brian's in this category because we spoke about this, Hasn't really been watching what Simone Biles has been doing. I've been looking at some of the stuff that's been posted on YouTube by the U.S. Olympic Committee and what she's been doing. And I've seen this, but clips have been floating around the Internet. You can see some of these moves that she's doing. She has four moves right now named after her, right? Moves that nobody else has done as a woman. Some men have done it, but not as a woman. And just to get a move named after you in gymnastics, you have to perform that on the Olympic stage or at least in the Olympic trial stage, right? Or in your country's championship to, to be able to have that name. Simone Biles has done that. She's doing incredibly difficult moves. I don't think people are recognizing how great of an athlete she is in terms of power, strength, flexibility, grace, all this stuff. But the thing about it is, and this is the point Jamel made in an article, she's amazingly dominant. She doesn't really have anybody in her class. Like she is killing everybody. Right. And she's expected to do it again at 24 years old at the Olympics this year and probably will. It'd be a huge disappointment if she does not. I think more, more people need to look at her. And I'm very clear on what I'm saying here. More people need to look at her as simply one of the greatest athletes of this generation, because what she's doing is unparalleled. People have done it. People don't think about it that way because it's gymnastics. Like, seriously, look at what she's doing and ask yourself if you know that many people who you call great athletes that could even pull that off. <laughs> the stuff she's doing is just amazing. Why, just if you're not, watch some of these videos, watch the degree of difficulty and then the execution of what she's doing. It's crazy. The, Brian, yeah. have, have, you, have you watched any of these, these videos and uh, do they at least drop your jaw in the way they're dropping my jaw? Yeah, I'm fanning over Simone Biles. I, I'm fine with that. She's freaking great. I don't know much about gymnastics, um, but I have seen some clips floating around. And there was one in particular. I couldn't tell you the name of the move. I don't know what the fuck it was, but just whatever. Call it, just call it the Biles. Just whatever it, the Biles. whatever it was, it was some shit I ain't never seen before. So I replayed it like four or five times or whatever. Mm -hmm. And I'm trying to connect it to another sport because, again, my gymnastics knowledge is pretty limited. I knew a gymnast when I was in high school, and she used to pick on my hair when I had an afro, so that was pretty cool. But other than that, don't really know that much about gymnastics. And uh, I think that... You know, I'm thinking about like other athletes who are just so dominant in their sport <laughs> at any point and their competition is just not near them at all. I think of like Roy Jones Jr. in the 90s, who was probably mm -hmm. the second most dominant athlete in the 90s after Michael Jordan. Michael Jordan is probably, you know, another example that you could use here. Um, but Roy Jones Jr. was so much better than all the other you know, middleweights, then light heavyweights, and then he eventually went up to heavyweight and then, you know, subsequently sort of ruined the back portion of his career. But before that, he was as good as anybody, pound for pound, number one, et cetera. Terrence Crawford is a more recent example of that, where he's just so much better. He unified all four titles at um, junior welterweight, 140 pounds, and was so much better than Julius Ndongo and Thierry John and, you know, uh, Amir Khan and everyone else they put in front of him. And Simone Biles, from what I'm reading, and from what I'm trying to understand, is like that level of dominant. You know, we yes. talk about Tiger, we talk about Serena, you know, Floyd Mayweather, another boxing example. Habib Nurmagomedov is somebody I mentioned in MMA because he not only went 29 and 0 for his career, he lost one round in his career, maybe two ever, and <laughs> against mixed mar in, in mixed martial arts at you know 145, 155 pounds. So yeah, I, I think that. 
this is how she should be talked about. Like she should be mentioned with all these other athletes that I'm mentioning because like these are the best by far in what they did, whether it be the entire sport or a weight class. And, you know, the stuff that she does has definitely gotten on my radar because I feel like the past few weeks, every other day or every three days or so, I just see a new clip and I'm like, what the fuck? Like, how, like, how do you even get to that level where you're able to do some shit like that? Cause I know I can't and nor would I try it. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> well, so. It's funny you talk about not trying it because there's this whole concern level around danger with her uh, in terms of what she's doing right now. But I, I want to, like, I'm glad you brought up Roy Jones and other people that have been extremely dominant. Because that's some, it's part of something we like in sports. People that the greatness is kind of determined by how dominant they are, especially in individual sports, right? How big is the gap between you and that next person? We talked about Wayne Gretzky not that long yeah, ago. Yeah, we talked about that on the podcast, right? And, and how that gap is so big in terms of him being labeled a GOAT, right? And I think this is actually going to be the same case for Simone Biles. We would have should have added Simone Biles into that conversation of who's the person in this sport where the GOAT Gap is so great. Simone Biles is mm. a GOAT in gymnastics right now. And the gap is really big between her and the next person, right? You could think about a lot of people. Look at this. Her all-around score at the U.S. Championships, right? Was a, this is ridiculous. Like, this is a, this is the equivalent of like a 50 point blowout in basketball. Okay. She was 4.7 points better than the runner up, Sunisa Lee, right? At the 2016 Olympics, her then teammate, uh, Allie Raceman, joked that placing second felt like an accomplishment. Because she said, I knew that gold was out of the question. <laughs> so the silver for me felt like gold. She knew that's how good Simone Biles were. She's so far ahead of the competition. But what's interesting, B, um, and I'm just, I'm just making sure that I get this, this correct here. So... You know, last month at the U.S. Championships um, in Indianapolis, she completed this move called the Yurchenko Double Pike, uh, which is a round off into a springboard, following with back handspring onto a vault, and then finishing with two back flips. Like, just saying that sounds ridiculous. Like, literally sounds ridiculous. But what I find interesting, and I've watched some of the commentary around Biles when she's doing moves or the announcers are talking about her, and I think I remember it was like, Maybe before the pandemic, she had done something in a gymnastics competition and people were asking her why she was doing these moves that were more dangerous so that people hadn't seen in women's gymnastics. And I loved her answer. And she was like, because I can. Word. Right. Like, that, like, there's nothing else to say beside that, like, because I can do it. Like, sports is about pushing yourself to the next level. Sports is about us seeing and doing things that nobody else has has doing it. So a lot of people there are skeptics out there saying the double pike is 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 too dangerous and she hasn't set limits on herself. And then it's interesting too, and I think we'll see this in the Olympics, is how the judges judge her. Because there have been some judges that have judged her um lower or far less, even though when she's doing more difficult moves. Um, you know, and I'm like, I'm like, nah, I think you should actually get rewarded higher for not just attempting the difficult moves, right? But attempting it and then executing the difficult moves at such a high level. And this is what Biles has done. So I'm really intrigued to see how the judges react to that as we move on into the Olympics, because look, if you've given her low scores because you think the move's too difficult or too dangerous, you're whack. You're hating. There's no need to do this. You don't need like why why are you being a hater? Because if you could do that, you'd be hyped. Stand in awe. Shit. Give her high marks because you're like, damn, I've never seen... Because you haven't seen anybody do this before. And instead, it's like, oh, no, no, it's too dangerous. I don't know because this might encourage other women to then go and do these moves that are too dangerous. Like, like Brian, this is stuff people are actually saying. <laughs> and I'm like, wait, don't we want other women to aspire to greatness? Why, why would we not want this? So, I don't know, man. I just feel like it should be on people's radar. We know people only tune into gymnastics around the Olympics. I mean, I'm not going to act like I watch gymnastics all the time because I don't. But I think this is something to be your eye on. And I think it definitely goes back to Brian's point about Gretzky being the GOAT and the gap in his sport. And we should start looking at Simone Biles and the gap she has in her sport. And not just that, how she clearly, clearly, undeniable to me, is one of the greatest athletes of all time and definitely one of the greatest athletes of this generation.
One time for your mind, we got some interesting stuff this week, uh, including Brian doing something that's right on brand for him that he would talk about, uh, that I'm actually sort of here for, and me talking about something that I am absolutely not here for. And if you think like me, you think highly of yourself, I think you'll probably know why I'm not here for this as well. Brian, what you got for one time for your mind? Former New York Jet. Six overall draft pick from 2008, Vernon Golson, who I was very excited about when I was a Jet fan, uh, that they got him, and he didn't even record a career sack. However, he somewhat redeemed himself over the weekend. Apparently, this video came out, incarcerated. Bob posted it. Of course he did. And uh, Vernon Golson was at uh, a parking lot of some sort, or maybe it was outside of a club, and a lot of guys looked like they wanted to fuck him up. We don't really have the context of like what happened. And um, he looked like he was trying to restrain himself and they just kept going at him and going at him. And I'm rewatching this right now as I'm talking. Like guys just kept trying to hit him and take cheap shots at him. And there were people getting involved and separating them. And of course, you see inevitably everybody's on their phone just watching the shit. He's trying to walk back into the establishment and not trying to really get involved with these people because he's so much bigger than them and he knows he could fuck them up. I mean, I think he was listed like 6'3", 260 when he was playing. And he actually still looks like he's in really good shape. And then at some point, he's like, all right, you know what? Fuck this. You guys keep you know instigating and egging me on. I'm just going to start tossing dudes. And then he starts just knocking people out all over the place. There was one dude in particular who he knocked out toward the end of the video. It was kind of like in the Royal Rumble when, you know, the one dude gets in the ring and then everybody just tries to charge at him and then they just freaking knock out everybody. You know what I mean? And then they get the spot where they're able to, like, just, you know, just take it in in front of the audience. <laughs> <laughs> so Vernon Golston, I feel like, um, is an American hero for the act that he did this week. And uh, look, when guys don't want to be fucked with, just don't fuck with them. You know what I mean? Like, that's really it. <laughs> wise, wise words from Brian Fonseca, Fonseca on this one. I'm laughing because I feel like the Royal Rumble reference was, like, so spot on. And two, <laughs> wise words, yes, don't fuck with the people that don't want to be fucked with. My take, the interesting thing in me watching this video was, <laughs> look, man, I can say this. I'm somebody, you know, I'm 6'2", 200 pounds. Uh, you know, I'm a little shorter than Vernon Golston, but we are not in the same weight class. <laughs> this is, like this, this should be noted for people in life. When you're not in the same weight class as people, you need to assess things a little differently, right? Like you should be looking at this like, yo, I can't do this. What happened there, I think, B is the mob mentality. They were like, oh no, all of us can take him. Wrong, <laughs> wrong. That wasn't gonna happen. Wrong. And what was crazy to me was there were some dudes who really, I saw there was one dude, he kind of got a good shot, it looked like, to Vernon Golston's chest, and Vernon Golston just ate it. And I felt like that was the moment in the video that everybody should have known this was a problem, right? <laughs> it's like back in the day when you're watching the cartoon and the puny little character hits the big character and, like, it does nothing, and the right. big character looks at him like, why did you do this, and just picks him up and throws him? That's what this was like. There's no need, there was no need for anybody to do this. And I can't blame Vernon Golston. I don't know what started this, like you said, B. You could clearly see the people were egging him on. He was trying to walk away. And then he just had to put people to sleep. And I'm all for that. When sometimes people do too much and they're yapping too much, or they come up in your personal space and touch you, as we saw here with Vernon Golston, you gotta put some people to sleep. Some people gotta take some punches to the face. And I hope, I hope, luckily nobody went to the car to get anything, because that could have ended up a lot worse. Um, and if you're from certain places, you understand what going to the car means. <laughs> but it could have ended up worse. But somebody, some, some, hope some of those people learn today. That's that's the only thing I, I hope they learn today. Got enough punches to the face, put people to sleep. Stop messing with people that are bigger than you. They're not. You're not in the same weight class. He had to show them the hands, and they 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 learned. Not in the same weight class. You think? Uh, you, th you think you think anybody's gonna sign up Vernon Golston for one of these uh bullshit <laughs> boxing fights? Uh, you, <laughs> it's oh, coming well, up. Well, huh. we'll see about that. So there's an the evolution to that, which we may or may not get into at some point. There was something I saw trending over the weekend called YouTubers versus TikTokers, and apparently they were boxing each other. Which you know, go ahead, stay over there. I hope that they all fucking you know fuck each other up and just stop fucking you know getting in our lives and shit. 
Uh, as far as the Vernon Golson thing, I even wonder when the video was. I saw it surface over the weekend. I have no like reference of when it was or whatever. But look, it surfaced over the weekend, and it was a fun thing to bring up. I will Has also, Vernon Golston commented on this? Has he said I, anything about this? I, I, I've looked, and I haven't seen much. I will say this. <clears throat> I was a little bit off. He was listed not 6'3", 260 when they drafted him, 6'3", and about 275. Um <laughs> you know, he he actually looks lighter than that now. I, I, again, he looks like he was uh, he was taking care of himself or whatever. But you know, to your point, it's kind of like when the Big Show would be in the Royal Rumble or a Battle Royal, and the Rey Mysterio hits him, and he just turns around, looks at him, and picks him up with his like palm, yeah. you know, from the top of his head. Like that's kind of <laughs> what it was. <laughs> yeah, looking at you like get out of here. You know, like and it, and like he, I think he knew he could hurt these people, and he didn't want to. But he had to go right. hope mode on him. I hope again. I hope those people learn, and I hope everybody learns out there. If you listen to this or watch the video, know the weight classes. Sometimes you got to know when you just got to tap out. You're not built for this. It's okay to go home because you can go home and go to sleep without somebody else putting you to sleep. It doesn't have to be that way. <laughs> it doesn't have to go down that way. Now, my thing on one time for your mind is simple. It's about cleanliness. My mom used to have the same. She would say cleanliness is next to godliness. And no matter what your religious belief is, I just think cleanliness is good, right? You should want to stay clean. You shouldn't want to be dirty, no matter what the circumstance is. You know, you do the things you need to do. Wash your body, brush your teeth, comb and brush your hair. You know, these are the things you should be doing. However, some of y'all out there, y'all don't believe what I believe. You're just lazy and nasty. Straight lazy and nasty. So I had this article. I sent this to Brian last week. This was in The Sun, UK publication, The Sun. And this was an uh, opinion piece wrote by Kate Wills. Headline, folks. I am a soap dodger. I never wear deodorant, don't own a hairbrush, and think washing myself is a massive waste of time. If you're watching this, do you see my face? Really? Massive waste of time? I mean, I guess if you don't care about being around other people, that's fine. You can keep the funk and stay by yourself. But what was interesting about this, and I hear you sighing, Brian, what was interesting about this is that people, there's been studies, I guess, or research among people that during the COVID-19 pandemic, people have and engaging less in some of the hygienic practices that they normally would do. Now, I can understand you might have been home a little bit more. Maybe you didn't feel like you needed to necessarily shower as often because you wasn't going anywhere, and maybe you might be by yourself. Well, well okay. I, I, did, I did point out the, yes. uh, the deodorant thing. You know, that's just once in a while, whatever, if you're just home all the time. Oh, we talked about that at the beginning. We talked about but, that at the beginning. But, but yeah, not, not more than a day, okay? Like, no. <laughs> like very strict or whatever. And like, I, I still shower, you know what I'm saying? Like, and do all the other fundamental shit. That's I don't crazy. know, man. Like reading this, reading this annoyed me to no end. Um, I read it too. I read it after you sent it to me it, and I was, it, I was it, not it, happy. It, it annoyed <laughs> me. People, people not washing the hair, you know, not, not showering. This woman saying that she knows that she's dirtier than most people. Yeah. I mean, that's not a revelation here. And I'm just like, I don't understand it. Like, I take pride in keeping myself clean, grooming myself, looking good. I take pride in that. I love taking showers. Great time for me to think. One of my favorite times to think all the time. And people out here saying they don't want to take a shower. And COVID, the thing you've learned through COVID is that you don't need to take care of yourself more. Okay. I, I just want to. I want to know who these people, who their friends are. I want to know who their family is. Who's checking them on this? Because I feel like if you do this, like, and you have no friends, then I'm like, oh, I get it. Like, it's fine. Like, I, I understand. You don't see anybody. You don't engage with anybody. Maybe you're just going to continue to re work remote, remotely forever. You never have to see anybody, and you could just stay funking it up in your apartment because nobody's going to care except for you and maybe the pet you have with you. But I feel like the pet doesn't even want that. Does anybody's dog or cat want that? I, well, I was going to say, didn't I wanted to say that she that there was some sort of reference as to like, doesn't she have a kid or a boyfriend or some shit that they reference in there? I don't know. But I, I saw, don't remember. There was, 
there was something in relate. I don't know who she's having sex with somebody, evidently. And listen, you couldn't pay me enough, honestly. <laughs> no, I mean, like, there's a, I mean, there's a price for everything. I always like, say there's no, a price for everything. No, there's a price. No, there's a price. No, for, first there's of all, price. first of all, doesn't appear to be my type. And I'll leave it. Th- I'll leave it at that. Well, well, and well. Th- to, to, to be to be fair to this woman, she did say she, and I'm saying she doesn't friend. Although I question her friends. So whenever I reveal my slovenly hygiene habits to my friends, they're shocked and are horrified, as they should be. But that's that's the thing. Like she's proud of it. Like she's like saying it. Like she's proud of it. And I think this is a British newspaper, so I'm picture picturing like a polite British accent emanating from this woman. And it's like, <laughs> yo, you're fucking nasty. Well, like, I wonder. I wonder if I wonder if you said. Uh, I wonder if this is why you thought she had a partner. Uh, because she said, I remember a mate staying over. But you got to remember in Britain, a mate is like homie. So that doesn't necessarily mean like that was her mate the way we use it. Yeah, here you don't States. always mate with your mate. Yeah. Like your mate is like your homie in, in the UK. You know what I mean? So like, you know, we were in, in London like, yo, you're, you're my mate, me and my mate Brian, we went to the game. Like that's kind of what you say. So I don't know. But like, yeah. Look, look, so, so, look, look. Somebody's up in there because dudes are nasty too. You know what I'm saying? Like, so, well, keep the nasty, people, you know the nasty saying? people. The nasty people could stay. The nasty people could stay together. This was like earlier in the pandemic. There was some article I read or found out. There's this whole thing about people talking about when they wash their wash in the shower, they don't wash their legs. And I was like, what? Yeah, yeah, we we've talked about that. I mean, which is no. pr- uh, apparently uh, pretty common around dudes. I remember the Levitar show, they were talking about this and they were sort of tossing that question around, like, how often do you watch your legs in the shower? Every day. And the, every answer, day. the answer was not unanimously every day, uh, to which I was like, dude, like, you, you like, I, I don't see. And for some reason, that's like not fundamental with some dudes where it's like they just sort of the top half and then you go like probably in the important part down there and you don't go below that. Probably. To, to which I'm like, yo. Like, no, you got to take care. I mean, don't you walk? You know what I mean? Like, Ooh. you got to take care of everything as best as you could. Uh, well, according to this, clearly some people don't. Uh, and maybe those people need the Vernon Golson treatment if they're getting taken care of. Maybe that'll work. <laughs> maybe, may, maybe that will. All right. Don't be lazy. Don't be nasty. Do better. That's it for this episode of the Ain't Hard to Tell podcast. Episode 182. Be sure to follow. A Hotel Podcast on all social media platforms at AHTT Podcast. Also, you watch on the Backpack Broadcasting YouTube channel. Hit that subscribe button. Get all the notifications about the latest episodes from us. And also support us on Patreon. A lot more of that coming up. Hopefully, we have uh, some really good stuff coming up later this month uh, around hip hop and some guests that we should have as well, too. More to talk about in the world of sports around the NBA, uh, the NBA Conference Finals and Finals. Also, uh, baseball starting to heat up. Mets are in first place. We haven't talked some Mets baseball. We got to start doing that in a little bit, B. But that is it for this episode of the Hotel Podcast. That's my man, Brian Fonseca. I am Dexter Henry. Until next time, y'all. Peace.